Hey, well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Travel Talk Tuesday. It is July the 12th, 2022, and I am uh, certainly glad to be back home in my kitchen in Middleburg, Florida, for a few weeks after being on the road for almost three months leading tours and uh, experiencing Europe. Thank you guys for joining in tonight as well, or for those of you who watch later on on the recorded broadcast, I really thank you for tuning in and being a part of this event. It's uh, really great to be back. Uh, I, I uh, spent probably the last month up in Ireland and Scotland and in that area where uh, I've worn a jacket every day. It didn't get above 65, 68 degrees. So to come to, home to Florida where it's in the mid 90s and the humidity's uh, unbelievable has been a rude awakening for me, but I am very happy to be back home. So because it's so hot here, uh, I want to give you uh, my favorite Italian uh, aperitivo drink, which is a Campari Spritz. Now, look at this little kindergarten bottle of Campari I had to buy. This is all I could find here. And uh, normally the bottle is about four times as big as that. And here in the States, it costs about uh, 45 bucks. But this one's $22. Can you believe that? $22. And it's, uh, I don't even know how many ounces it is. And who knows, but it's a, a small amount anyway. So Campari goes like this, one third, one third Campari. And I got some Prosecco here. That's the Italian champagne sparkling wine. This is uh, easily available all over the place. A little Prosecco about two thirds is Prosecco. And if you're a real Italian, they put a little dash of soda water on top of that, which I do happen to have some right here in my, stir it up. And let's see how well I did. Give it a taste, salute. Ah, it makes me feel like I'm in Italy again. My goodness, that's great. Okay, I've got a lot prepared for you today. Like I said, I have been all around Europe. Uh, Canada up this afternoon. We've had a total of 10 tours so far um, uh, the last uh, couple of three months. Actually, 11 tours the last couple of three months if I count the Amalfi tour that I did earlier. So let me, let me start sharing my screen here. And, and that's it, right? Yep and let this run for a minute and I'll talk a little bit about my travels. This is a map that I drew up some uh, weeks ago about all the tour routes we have all over Europe. And you can see 25, 26 different tour routes everywhere. <clears throat> and uh, we've done 11 of those already and we got some more on the docket for the rest of this year. Uh, I first started out in, in the first, middle of April doing my Tusca Villa vacation. Uh, these are the, some of the folks that were on that first tour in Tuscany. And then I flew over to Ireland. I did the uh, my Taste of Ireland tour that begins in Dublin, ends in Dublin. These are some of the people that are there at the, rock, at the um, uh, area there in Dingle. And then went back to Tuscany and did another Tuscan Villa tour. Charlotte and I were there with my friends Kelly LaRosa and all their friends. So we had a great time. This is at Podera Marcampo at their tasting room. Uh, we had a cooking class at their restaurant, by the way. And so we were able to do the cooking class at the restaurant. From there, I flew to uh, Austria and we did the uh, Germany, Austria and Switzerland tour with uh, these friends, uh, Ken and Patty and, and the rest of the gang. So we had a great time going from Vienna all the way over to Switzerland, back up to Munich. This is a little bus that we had. And we had that same sort of bus all over, all over Europe. It's uh, called a Mercedes Sprinter, seats about 19 people. And I got plenty of room for everybody in my tour groups. Uh, my groups are never larger than about uh, 10 people. So we had plenty of extra room in there. Uh, from that point, after I finished up in Munich, I left. I had, this was the only time that I had any difficulty with flights in Europe uh, or flights anywhere, actually. And that was, I was trying to fly from uh, Munich over to Dublin. And uh, I tried Ryanair. I booked a flight, had that booked for several weeks. And then a couple of days before the flight took off, 
got a notice from Ryan Air that said uh, that uh, the flight has been canceled. Nothing I can do about it. They canceled and refunded my money right away. I didn't even have to ask for it. So I got online and I uh, found the next flight I could find, which was a KLM flight. And uh, that was uh, directly from Munich to Amsterdam and then from Amsterdam over to Dublin. The morning I was due to fly, I got an email, your flight's been canceled. Too bad, if you want a refund, you're gonna have to ask for it. So I had to go through a whole lot of red tape for that. But thankfully I was able to um, find another flight on British Air that uh, went through uh, London. And so I was able to get, uh, get there through London, but I ended up, because I had to book it the day of the flight, I ended up having to pay a whole lot more than I did initially. But that was the only time that I flew around all over the place that I had any difficulty flying anywhere. And uh, I can tell you what, the airports are busy here in the United States and also all over Europe as well. People are flying all over the place. You may have heard some of the horror stories about uh, the Dublin airport being packed out. And boy, uh, one of these travel talk Tuesdays, I'm gonna show you the experience I had. We, we made it through just fine, but the lines were out the door, wrapping around the outside of the terminal and everything else. So it was really crazy, but uh, all in all, everything worked as far as flying goes. Uh, I actually, uh, the next screen slide here is um, the newest tour that I designed and uh, implemented finally. Uh, and that was uh, four days in London, and then we, or three days in London, we do Stonehenge, Bath, uh, and Oxford, and then we get on a plane and we fly directly up to Inverness in Scotland. It's about an hour and 20 minute flight. And then we uh, proceeded to visit the battlefield of Culloden, Inverness, Loch Ness, uh, several castles, visited Oban, the Hebrides Islands, of Mull and then finished up in Edinburgh. That tour went off without a hitch and the, 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 the folks who were on it with me just, just loved the experience. And uh, we were able to pack in those two countries and adding the flight to that uh, cut off a whole day of travel trying to get between the two countries. So that worked great as well. This is my group here in London. And uh, this friend, this is uh, Blaine. He was part of that group too. He's ready to eat. I think we're up in Edinburgh somewhere. Uh, then I went back over to Dublin. We did a Taste of Ireland tour again. And I had five days off and I was able to go up uh, to the very Northern part of the Republic of Ireland in County Donegal and uh, visit a town of Buncrana. And the um, peninsula all up there, and it was just a place I've never been and experienced before. But I was able to go up there and take a couple of days uh, to uh, learn about this new area. And this is one of the ring forts. It's Grinnan of Alec, and uh, it's a, a huge ring fort built in the sixth century or so they think, uh, and probably fortified in the sixth century, but probably it was uh, an earthen fort before that. So that's a pretty cool thing right there. So I was able to spend a few days there before coming back and doing my um, Ireland tour and the new newly uh, minted tour of what I'm calling as Ireland and Scotland tour. Uh, while I was doing all of that, my tour guide friend, Ilaria, was uh, leading the tour in um, down in uh, Italy, doing the Best of Italy tour and the Taste of Italy tour. This is Ilaria here on the uh, right-hand side of the screen, the redhead, and she's just a fantastic tour guide. Everybody loves her, and this is a uh, part of the tour group there in Rome having dinner their first night on tour. And uh, so Ilaria did the Best of Italy Taste, our Best of Italy Taste of Italy tour, and then my friend Jason did, uh, Jason Duckett did two tours, of Taste of Ireland tours back to back uh, to eight day tours. And this is a scene on the, that Jason took of some of his groups that are there in one of the pubs. The other one was in the statue of Molly Malone. This is a young lady named Grace with a lamb, hold a baby lamb. This is Jason and Jill, newly engaged. She's sporting her ring that Jason hey, gave her on tour. Even McGuffin here. I am in Rome, Italy. I just flew in this morning and I've uh, spent the day kind of tying up some business here, but I am in the historic 
square known as Piazza Barberini. Now, back here behind me is a famous fountain by Bernini. And let me see if I can switch this around. Now, this is a first time on Facebook Live with my phone. So, so you may remember that uh, when I left here, back in mid-April, I had grand plans of uh, presenting Travel Talk Tuesday, at least recording it every week, and then uh, having Leslie here uh, play it uh, live, or at least the recorded section live at 7.30 on Tuesday nights. Well, that lasted about a, not even a week. I got one done. The second one I started working on and just said, no, there's no way, I cannot lead a tour. I can't, uh, you know, be there to uh, show these people around Europe and try to record content and edit it and everything else. So that went out the window. I didn't do that at all. But then I had another bright idea where I thought, OK, maybe it's seven o'clock every night, my time, wherever I am, I'm going to do a Facebook live video and try to uh, give those people that want to sign in and watch an opportunity to see where I am, what I'm doing. Well, that didn't go according to plan either because uh, seven o'clock is right around the, uh, the time we're getting ready for dinner or doing something. And uh, so we just had very sporadic on my part doing it. So I was able to eke out of some of those, but there was nothing with any regularity at all. So uh, these are some of the outtakes from that. And here I am in this the very first time. Uh, Barberini and a famous fountain by Bernini made and uh, sculpted by uh, uh, John Lorenzo Bernini in 1642 to 1643. Uh, so here we go. We're going to turn down this small little street, which has been my route to get from this Piazza Barberini to historic Rome Center for 20 or 30 years. So I'm just uh, kind of walking down here. You can see it's kind of duffy. This is the backside of a restaurant, several restaurants, but historic cobble streets. Lots of restaurants here, many of them catering to tourists. As a matter of fact, tourism is picking up pretty heavily here in Rome. I see it looks like Caroline and Joanne and Jen Snow, you guys are all watching. These restaurants here are very touristy. You can see with the hawkers outside and then menus in many different languages, this would not be a place that I would sit down and have dinner. You can also see it's pretty getting pretty crowded here as well. Lots of families here. And here we are behind a rental truck of all the things we want to see. Pandemic when things were coming a little bit cleaner and it was pretty nice here, not so crowded at all. October last year, we were crowded again. And then we were just here a couple of weeks ago, even more crowded, but just two weeks after that, a lot different. So, not the cafe. Here we go. The market selling pretty decent stuff. Some gelato authentic Roman cuisine. So I'm reaching right here the Piazza di Trevi. Trevi comes from the uh, Italian word, Latin word, meaning the intersection of three streets. So it's the street one that I'm on, street two over here, street three over here, and here is the Trevi Fountain. It began construction in 1732 and if my uh, memory is correct it took about 12 years to totally complete it's 86 feet tall about 160 wide this water comes from 10 miles from here uh, the Apennine mountains are not too far from here and an aqueduct built in the uh, Roman era in the second and third century AD brings water all the way into Rome and this aqueduct is still active today bringing water to this Trevi fountain. 
Now, that is I told you, a lot of people around the Trevi Falcon. Not as many as there was in COVID-60, but quite there was all the three coins in a fountain. And the idea of that whole um, movie was that there were three young ladies that came here and fell in love. So three different people threw in a coin. And the idea of the premise is if you come here, turn around, and with your right hand, if you take a coin in your right hand and throw it over your left shoulder, you'll return back to Rome. Now, pre-COVID, there's about 3,000 euro a day that is collected here in the Trevi Fountain. And it's given to a local supermarket to provide free food for the homeless. So thank you guys for sticking with me my first attempt of a, an alive event on uh, Facebook here from on the site in Rome. So thank you guys for watching. I'm going to try to do it again 24 hours from now. Uh, 7 p.m. here in Italy, the 1 p.m. Eastern time, where you guys are or further. From the there, I got so on a train and, and rode right up to uh, Pisa, Thank you which is uh, gearing up to begin my first villa tour. So here I'm in, in Pisa. Hey, David McGuffin here. I am Two out days of Rome. Row, I was able to do Traveled that. north and, and I'm that in was the about town it. of Pisa. Now, many people think Pisa is only famous for its leaning tower and the church complex, but Pisa is a really cool town. I'm in this uh, grand Piazza of the Calvary. I'll show you here right behind me, Piazza de Calvary. And as you can see, it has a lot of cool buildings on it. There's a church here, and this building here, right over here, is a school. Believe it or not, the local high school for the, pe the, the kids that live here in Pisa. I'm gonna take a walk behind me down this this aisle down here we're going to take a 10 minute walk and kind of make our way down toward the leaning tower and let me show you a little bit of what's what's happening here in pisa now a wonderful public space right here so i'm going to comment in a minute but this most people do not uh that go to pisa do not uh, even walk through this part of town. There's a beautiful little pedestrian street and a pedestrian part of town from the train station all the way to the Leaning Tower. And I'm about halfway down that wall. I have passed the main shopping street, uh, pedestrian shopping street with all the stores that people would go to that locals would visit. I've come to where this local high school is. And now I'm walking and getting closer within about 100 yards of the Leaning Tower of Pisa in this little park. Right. Ristorante Novecento. So 900. This is the aperitivi hour. It's a seven o'clock, a little after seven o'clock here in Pisa. Thank you guys for taking your afternoon wherever you are and checking in with me. And tourism is only prevalent here in Pisa in the middle of the day, let's say between 10 and 4, because groups come in on buses. The buses park a little bit outside of town. It costs 160 euro to park your bus there, and tourists walk in to see the Leaning Tower and the church, and then they walk back and move on their way to wherever else they're going. <laughs> So you, maybe you caught this conversation from the gentleman here. Said he lives here. He sees people are crazy. Maybe, I think he used the word drunk. There's a young guy that uh, came up next to me as I was walking and filming. He thought I was very famous and had uh, you know, 200 to 2,000 people online watching me do this live stream. So he wanted to be a part of it. You'll see him in just a minute. I get to meet him and uh, I introduce him. I don't know, but everybody looks pretty calm. Coming to the end here, I'll show you the Field of Miracles. Now, this church complex is typical of any other complex in Tuscany, meaning that it has the main church, the Duomo, and the church faces east to west with the doors on the western end, 
to enter the church and then the altar facing uh, toward. Sorry, 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 sorry. Can I have one more question? Yeah. Can I have a. Um... No, no, no. You, you have families, no? In, in this moment, you have, you have you want to, two, no. 200 uh, people uh, see, maybe, watch you. Maybe, yes. Uh, yes, and uh, I would uh, ask for Can I have. Uh... Can I. Here. Um... Sono famoso. Well, you get a little dip into the culture as well. Nice young man, Giuseppe. Okay, here we are, what I came to show you, the Leaning Tower here. It was not leaning initially. It was built, it started construction in 1173, I believe, if my facts serve me correct. And it took 200 years up until 1372 to complete. And you can see right there, I'm holding my camera straight up and you can see how it's leaning. I believe, I didn't do my research, but from past times that I've been here, I believe that it is about a 20 foot cant, uh, cantered looking to the right off center. And you can see how it's settled. So after the first about 60 years, uh, they noticed that they got three stories done and the tower started leaning. Construction was stopped and then Along about 20 years later, so this is about 100 years into it, it started again. I don't know if you can see, but right here in this area, they began construction again 100 years later in the 1200s. And you can see that they tried to correct it by making making the tower lean this way a little bit. And uh, so it took another 100 years to get it completed. And the tower has kept leaning, kept leaning, kept leaning. A lot through the centuries has been done to try to keep it from leaning, but it wasn't until the late 20th century when uh, some sand was pumped in to, the, uh, to this uh, leaning side and taken out of the far side, and some counterweights and balances were put in here. And now you can actually go to the top. And as tourists, we can climb up there. Okay, gonna wrap this up real quick. I'm facing the sun, but you see the building down here right next to the sun is the baptistry. Every church in Tuscany has a separate baptistry and then the amazing Duomo. This is all built in the uh, 9, 10, and 11th century. And it is one of the best examples or of a Pisano uh, architectural style. This particular style uh, from Venice or from, um, from Pisa that was uh, kind of stolen from Venice and parts further to the east, so the Moorish land, so Eastern European. And so you can see a lot of frills everywhere on here. And uh, so. Oh, okay. Hey, David dancing. McGuffin here. My gosh, I am 30 minutes late doing this. And that's what happens when we got caught up in the. A few days uh, later in Volterra. Sorry, uh, everybody. Uh, and but maybe most stuff uh, later on, but, uh, important in this, and uh, favorite wine, wine now. Wine bar. Yeah. Free dinner here in Volterra. We're in Volterra, Italy. This is on my and, uh, first uh, my villa tour that we did in uh, late April. And what, what the deal is, is that it's, it's very cold. It's like 50 degrees outside and drizzling rain. And uh, so I dipped into this, uh, this place called Volta Terra, V-O-L-T-A, T-E-R-A. -E. So a play on the words of the town Volterra. And so I have uh, dipped in here, and uh, we came in here to get warm. So there's seven of us in here tonight, and we're having a great time because we're going to dinner later on. So we had about an hour and a half or so here in town. And uh, you can see this little wine bar. There's all kind of uh, wines in from Tuscany here. I want to, everybody that's on my trip has said they're okay to be on camera. So I'm going to flip this over here and uh, let, me, let me show you. So this is my uh, veteran travelers, Roberta and Jen, Jim.
and they're having a little prosecco, prosecco with uh, some uh, scutini, their appetizer. And uh, then Alan and Jeanette, they're having uh, their Campari spritz. Yeah? A toast. Yeah, salute. Yeah. Salute. 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 And, uh, and then from our hometown in Orange Park, Florida, hey. Lynn and Kathy, uh, they're having a little Bermantino white wine, Bermantino white wine, and uh, so from the region here as well. So we're having a great time here. Let me just spin around the room. I'm going to actually get up and walk, and actually I'm going to walk out to the piazza here and do a little video. So the Piazza Priori, just here, the square here in Volterra. I want to show it to you because this is my favorite little hill town in Tuscany. Thank you guys for joining in. And again, I apologize for being so dang late. <laughs> All of the this is the main city hall square. This is a city hall that predates even Florence. The, the uh, city hall, this is the Piazza di Priori. But anyway, you can see Volterra is one of my favorite, my favorite cities. And Volterra is a destination on my tour of the villa, the villa tour, uh, seven nights here in Volterra. But we also come here with the Best of Italy tour for two nights and the Essence of Italy tour uh, for two nights as well. So uh, regardless, you got to spend time here in Volterra. So thank you guys very much for uh, being a part of this tonight. And I apologize for being late. I don't know where I'm going to be tomorrow night, but uh, I will be home probably at 7 o'clock. Uh, and uh, we'll see how it all goes. So from Volterra, salute al tutti. Cheers to everyone from Volterra, Italy. Hey, David McGuffin here. Coming to you a little bit late from my uh, scheduled uh, 7 p.m. Um, Facebook Live presentation, but maybe you can tell I am in Florence, Italy. It's about 7, 17 in the evening. Uh, thank you guys for watching now or watching later. I appreciate it, but this is uh, one of the grandest squares in all of Europe. The uh, Piazza Signoria, and with the Medici Palace right here behind me. Let me just flip this phone around and talk to you just a little bit about it. So this famous guy, Cosimo Medici, founded this city back in the 1300s, and they were very famous physicians, bankers, doctors, and this Palazzo, this palace, fortified palace was built and modeled after the palace we see in Volterra, which is where we were the last few days. The loggia over here houses some of the most important works of art in the entire world, especially Renaissance art. Uh, one of these is the uh, Rape of the Sabine Women by John Bologna. And uh, then there's a bronze statue over here too, is uh, done by the master uh, goldsmith and craftsman Cellini. And it is uh, Persus with the head of Medusa. There's a lot of other famous statues there, but I can't ha help by pointing my camera in the direction of the main door to this old palace. And uh, you see the statue on the left is where Michelangelo's David stood for years and centuries and centuries. And it was just in uh, a little more than 100 years ago that it was uh, actually about 300 years ago that it was taken away and put into the uh, Academia uh, Gallery about oh a mile from here. But this is a replica of the Statue of David that, Nicol that Michelangelo uh, crafted and cut in 1503. And uh, we've got a wonderful statue of a uh, fountain of Neptune been cleaned it was being cleaned in 2019 and then i guess they really got to work on it in the pandemic era and uh, so things are uh, all looking up good here in the main square we're gonna we're gonna head over in this direction and 
uh, get some dinner tonight and kind of finish up our uh, tour of the Villa Tour of Italy. We've been uh, seven nights in Poder Marcampo and Volterra, and then we're back here for the night to close out that tour. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to the airport in Pisa, getting on a plane and flying over to Dublin. So a totally different uh, group of people that I'll be with, a totally different environment. I won't have to worry about speaking Italian. Uh, English is spoken in Dublin, so we'll have a great time there. Probably gonna switch out wine for, uh, for Guinness, and but we'll have a great time. So thanks for watching tonight. I will catch you tomorrow, I hope around 7, 7 p.m. Dublin time, 1 p.m. Florida time, Eastern Daylight time tomorrow from Dublin. Hey, your adventure starts right here with David McGuffin's Exploring Europe. Thank you guys for watching. We'll catch you later. Ciao from Firenze, from Florence. Gosh, my hair is all messed up here. <laughs> David McGuffin here from Florence, Italy. Thank you for joining me tonight on our little uh, trek across the uh, designed by uh, Filippo Brunelles Brunelleschi in the early 1400s and uh, he actually died before everything was completed but later on these tombs were completed and many of the Medici people the Medici family were buried in here and in later days Michelangelo was uh, commissioned to cast uh, and sculpt the tombs for the Medici family which are now in the very in the very background here you can just see Brunelleschi's dome from the Duomo in Florence peeking through in the sky now that is the crown jewel of Florence the cathedral was commissioned in 1296 to be the largest cathedral in all of Italy and maybe in all of the world and the people who were in charge of that, the elders of the church, which were known as the opera, were um, uh, made a huge grand cathedral that had a hole in the ceiling that was 140 feet wide. They knew because the Romans and Greeks had predated them a thousand years earlier, they knew that there was a possibility to build a dome but no one in the Middle Ages knew how to build a dome. So around after 1296, the walls were all put up on the outside. Fast forward to the year 1400, still no plan to put a, a dome or a roof on this church. So it sat unfinished. And then along came Filippo Brunelleschi. He came up with the design, went down to, Flor went down to Rome, looked at the, um, dome in the pantheon down there and this is the pantheon in rome domes in all the world actually many people think this is the most beautiful dome in all the world and that's the dome there uh on the cathedral santa maria de fiore saint mary the flowers church here um i'm sitting here because i was waiting on my group to show up and they finally did so let me see if i can get them they're over here counting their euro but let me see. Are y'all okay? Are y'all okay to be on camera for a second? No, it's okay. Okay. Here, wait a minute. Okay, hold it. Here we go. So this is Roberta and Jim and Alan and Jeanette. We're all sitting here having a, going to have 
and the aperitivo here at this uh, this place. We uh, are right near the San Lorenzo market, le the leather market here. Did you guys spend some time at the leather market? Or yep. We did. Yep. Did you buy anything people. or no? No, actually. Check it out. Check it out. Oh, oh you, got got a, you got a paper boy hat. That's what I call it. I have one of those in my suitcase, too. Yeah. It's great. I needed a hat, but I deliberately didn't bring one. Yeah, there you go. So you, you, you got one. one from Florence. He actually yeah. bought a leather jacket. Him and Roberta have been to Italy with me before, pricey. so thank you guys for drinking it. Bringing uh, <laughs> Alan and Jeanette, Jeanette along with us here. And uh, so that's what's going on here from Florence. Uh, we've got dinner soon and got drinks coming up soon here. But from the Grand Cathedral, San Lorenzo Basilica, here in Florence, your adventure starts right here. Hey, David McGuffin here, coming to you from Oban Bay. So I just filmed this uh, just last week when I, a day or two before I came back. You can see my hair has uh, <laughs> grown quite a bit during those times. I was not about to get a haircut from a Turkish barber, which are all over uh, Ireland and England and Scotland because they give you white walls. And uh, so uh, I was lucky to get back home and finally get a haircut from uh, my friend Mandy, who cuts my hair all the time. So in Scotland. I'm completing my last two nights of a three-month experience here in Europe. We began the first part of April uh, down in the Amalfi Coast, and here I am finishing it up in Oban, Scotland. One thing for sure, tourism is back. There are people every destination that we have visited from all walks of life, all countries all over the world. The sad thing is that things are a lot, less, lot more expensive than they were pre-COVID. Hotel prices are up about 60 to 70 percent. Transportation, as you know, just like uh, at home, fuel prices are high. That means transportation has been twice as much as it has been pre-COVID. Consequently, it costs a lot more to, to fund a David McGuffin tour than it did in 2019. So, listen guys. I'm coming home after three months of traveling here and we're going to run a special at the current tour prices through the middle of July. And then I have got to raise my prices to cover some of these expenses. 10 to 15 to 20 percent depending on what tour and what destination it is. So if you're interested in traveling either this year or next year, go ahead and book it at the low prices we have today because i can assure you it's going to cost more the next time hey listen from oban scotland your adventure starts right here with david mcguffin's exploring europe we hope to have you travel with us sometime in the near future I'm going to let this next segment run so I can tell you a little bit about what's coming up next. Because in the fall, in August 22, I head over to Spain and we do our best of Spain tour. That is uh, Barcelona, Madrid, Segovia, Toledo, Granada, Nerja, Arcos, and Sevilla. It's about a two-week tour. We'd love to have you join us. And then from there, we go up to Paris and we do the Best of France tour, which begins and ends Paris, but it goes to uh, the Burgundy Bon, Bon and the Burgundy wine country, Amboise, the Loire Valley, Dinan and Mont Saint-Michel, and of course, a couple of three days in Normandy as well before returning to Paris. Uh, also, we're doing our uh, Taste of Ireland tour, uh, September 18 to 25, and uh, that begins and ends in Dublin. It's a eight day tour. We'd love to have you join us on that. And then, of course, the best of Ireland and Scotland, September 18 to October 1. And that's uh, the, best of the best of both islands. We'd love to have you join us on that, too. Uh, sign up before the 25th of this month uh, for the current tour prices. Uh, you're, you're not going to be disappointed. And then, uh, gosh, we have this one, the best of Greece, which is uh, right out of the box. It's one of the best tours we've ever done. All the bells and whistles, 
Everything is included there. We'd love to have you travel with us in October. Then I finally get to come back home and take a couple of uh, weeks, few weeks off. And we have three Christmas markets back to back. Uh, we have our uh, newest tour, the one I call uh, Christmas markets in Germany, France, and Italy. And then we have our classic Christmas tour in Austria and Germany. And finally, followed by Christmas tour, uh, the best of Eastern Europe Christmas markets. Those are all eight day tours, Sunday to Sunday. We'd love to have you join those as well. Um, so that's what we've got going on the rest of the year, beginning the 22nd of August. Now, I think with that said, I'm close to the end. Yes, I am. So I'm coming back here on camera. Here I am. And uh, thank you guys for watching. Uh, it's kind of a hodgepodge. Uh, I've got a lot of content. Uh, boy, I tell you what, with three months of traveling around, I have a whole lot of content that uh, we need to pull together. And uh, we've done some really great, uh, really great tours and had some fine people that have traveled with me. Uh, I just think some of the best people in the world end up traveling with me and uh, my other tour guides. And we get nothing but uh, great comments and reviews from them. So we'd love to have you travel with us as well. I'm going to be back doing Travel Talk Tuesday every Tuesday night for the next, uh, gosh, three or four weeks. I can't remember when, but uh, I'm flying back to Europe on the 20th of August. So that means that Travel Talk Tuesday stops for a while until then. But until that time, uh, please join me every Tuesday night, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. We'd love to have you uh, check in and see how things are going and uh, contribute as well. Send me an email, send me a text, anything you want to know. We've had a lot of people online tonight. So thank you so much for being there. And until next week, hey, your adventure starts right here with David McGuffin's Exploring Europe. <laughs>